Good evening, everybody. This is Patrick from the Poison Pen Bookstore, and we're here with another of our virtual events. And tonight, we're here with Stephen Saylor to discuss his brand new book, Dominus. And we have a, a very dwindling supply of signed copies. Um, but I'll go ahead and put a, uh, a link in the comments field if you'd like to order one. And joining us is, is uh, Stephen's longtime editor, Keith Kayla. Welcome to have you both here. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll be Thank again. You. I'll be monitoring the comments. If you have questions for Stephen, uh, aka Istvan, Istvan Varga, uh, or is Keith, that my Google what, identity? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead and put them in the comments, and I'll I'll reemerge from the darkness towards the end of the program. But I'm going to hand it over to you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Well, Abe. I am drinking a yeah. toast because this is Stephen's publication date. And did I hear you say before we started, this is your first ever Zoom event? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, we are delighted to have- I am a Zoom virgin. I'm not virginal in any other way, but I am a Zoom virgin. How rare it is that anyone our age could actually claim to be a virgin of anything. I love that. And Keith Kayla has been Stephen's editor for 30 years. Has it been every single book, Keith? Well, Technically, I was the assistant to the editor mm -hmm. of his first uh, three in the Roma Sub Rosa, and I took over with the fourth, but I was certainly there when the, uh, the editor came back with a box of uh, manuscript from a writer's conference and, uh, you know, through the whole process. I love it. So here is my own treasured copy of the very first Roman blood autographed by Stephen. And we're we didn't do we didn't do too badly with a cover. Worth oh, an yeah. absolute fortune. I actually traded out um, an article in I'm trying to remember the name of the magazine. It was for book collectors. It'll come to me. Um, and my fee was his copy of Roman mm. Blood, which I which I really treasure. Um, I have the entire run of Stephen's books, with one exception, which we just noted. I have here with me. Empire, which is the second book in the Roma trilogy, before the one we're going to talk about tonight, i.e. Dominus, but I am missing Roma, the so first. I may prevail upon Stephen to find a copy and send it to me. It will be on so its way. I'm going to ask you, Stephen, to get us going by explaining to us, because you actually write it out in the front part of the book, tell us the etymology of Dominus and why you chose that to be the title. Well, I chose it because the first book was called Roma, the second book was called Empire, and then what the hell were we gonna do for a title for the third book? It has to be one word, right? One word. So, um, I don't know, we thought about maybe Imperium, but what does that really mean to people? And uh, I came up with Dominus because Dominus uh, originally is the Latin word that a slave uses to address his master. His mistress would be Domina. So it's the person who looms over you. Eventually, when the Republic ends and we have an empire and emperors, some of them demand to be called Dominus by their subjects, others specifically do not because of the connotations of servility. And then later on, when the, Christian, when the empire becomes Christian with Constantine and afterwards, Dominus increasingly becomes what the word used for the Christian God. So it evolved, and since this book ends with Constantine and the beginning of the Christian empire, uh, it was a great word, and it was my agent who actually sort of gave the green light on it. So I sort of thank him in the afterward. Well, it's it's actually it's an excellent title. In um, was Constantine was converted by his mother. Do I have that right, Helena? Was it? well, it's hard to say. Was he ever converted? We don't really know for sure. We don't know if he was ever baptized. That's kind of controversy over that. On his deathbed, he waited as late as possible. <laughs> Uh, because you, when you're emperor of Rome, you really have got to sin. You, you can't rule the empire without sinning and killing people. So uh, some people think he waited until the last moment and was baptized. Some people, we don't really know. But certainly his mother became a very um, uh, powerful Christian influence. And she's the one, her name is Helena. She's the person who goes on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and miraculously is said to have found the, tr the, 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 the cross that Jesus was, was crucified on and dug it up. And of course, many pieces of that uh, appear as relics all over Europe uh, to this day. Right, so that ended in what, 337? And you're I starting think. this book in roughly circa 165, it says, and Keith, I, I commend you for putting in 
the map. The map. I think I think maps are uh, absolutely well. I, I'm going to have to take the credit. I will say I had a great map maker who charged the right amount to yeah, get if you done. Look at the, if you look at the, the signature in the corner, you'll see it's me. I've been oh, making cool. the maps for years now. Well, in but fact, always, always. At least, they, at least they included it and printed it. I mean, I am, there are two mm. schools of thought, but I have always been a person, because I love historical fiction, who really likes maps and, you know, to ground myself in, um, in where we are at a particular time. Um, because maps change all the time. Well, the map, you know, the, there's a lot of flux in the countries well, and so forth. The geography may not change, but the names oh, yeah. do and so forth. For me, the, uh, the allure of having a map in a book goes back to when I read Tolkien when I was a boy. And those maps of Middle Earth, just fascinating. I spent hours poring over those, that imaginary landscape. So, and then I think Mary Renault had them in her books of the, of the ancient Greek world. Uh, so I've always wanted to have maps in my books, especially if they were appropriate. And starting with Roman blood, I, I made that map. And that goes back to the days of laying out mechanicals where you had pieces of paper pasted down and plastic overlay and a man with a camera had to shoot it. And uh, I've evolved up to where I do, uh, uh, what's it called? The um, uh, whatever, Photoshop, Photoshop, yes. Uh, so yes, I've, I've made the maps for years now. So Keith, as the publisher, is there any particular objection to maps? Are they just expensive or finding a reliable map maker or, or mm -hmm. what the hell? It's it's one more thing. I mean, first of all, I mean, I've done them. I mean, they're not just Stephen, but uh, in other books that there are maps that you need to orient yourself. But yeah, no, you have to hire a map maker. The design department generally knows it. Uh, the paperwork involved is time consuming mm -hmm. and, you know, there is money out the door, which of course, you know, publishers always have a quibble with that. So, you know, it's uh, it's one of those things. And usually, frankly, it's it, it adds a certain amount of time to the production schedule, which again, we're usually behind. Well, I think also, uh, if you hire a map maker, he, he or she has to confer very closely with the author to produce an acceptable map for not only the reader, but also the author. But we skip that stage since I do the map myself. I'm totally responsible for any errors, any misspellings, or anything that's not right about the map. So I have to do a very uh, uh, a careful job. Well, I congratulate you. I absolutely love maps, and I've been in many, many museums that you know reflect um, how the ancient world kept changing. And a map is the only way I can ever keep track of it. One more thing before we revert to the actual contents of the book is there is also a very helpful genealogy here. The Panari, how do you pronounce, is it Panari? The Panarii. Panarii. Oh, the Panarius family. Okay, in the imperial period. And, um, and helpfully, here it is. And explain to us, Stephen, why some of it is in bold type. Now the bold type, well, in the very first book in the trilogy, Roma, uh, it begins with this family that um, has an, an amulet. And many of the amulets in ancient Rome were phalluses. And it's a phallus with wings, which they thought was a god. Uh, and this is a peculiarly Roman god. There, you don't find this in, in ancient Greece or other or Carthage. And it goes way, way back. It's kind of one of the most primal uh, deities we can find of the Romans, even before Rome existed, when it was just a trading post and tribes. So this family has this amulet, which is passed down from generation to, to a generation. And it goes all the way from ancient Rome before when, when Hercules visited in legendary times, and all the way up to Constantine, when we leave behind all of these amulets because they're thought to, to be evil. So were they basically fertility symbols? Well, you can make of it what you want. It's a, 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 one of the ancient sources talks about uh, seeing a hovering phallus in a fireplace. <laughs> and the Romans, I don't know, this is something, we got to worship that. We better start worshiping that. Uh, and actually, the amulet, you'll, every museum that has any Roman artifacts has hundreds of these amulets because everybody had them from rich to poor and they were put in the cribs of babies uh, because they, they protected anyone from the evil eye, which was the gaze of the envious, which could cause you physical harm. In the ancient world, we have to remember it's very superstitious, very magic oriented. 
they don't really understand how anything works scientifically. So it's always these magical forces at work that you want to get on top of and try to get on your side. So there's even one of these phallic amulets that is kept by the Vestal Virgins, ironically enough. And when an emperor has a triumph in a parade through Rome after he's, he's won a, a war or something, they put this amulet under his chariot. It's not really visible, but it's there to protect him from the evil eye, the gaze of the envious, because everyone gazing at him, of course, may feel envy, and that could cause physical harm to the emperor. So the, the bold type in that genealogy is, is the members of the family that actually hold the, the uh, amulet through time. I love it. A flying phallus is a, <laughs> it's so great. Yeah, I've been in Peru where there are whole museums devoted to fertility figures and they're all women. I, you know, mm. almost all women. So it's that, that is some, yeah, that is why perhaps it's said that it's peculiar to Rome that they have these, these amulets. Well, Keith, let's pass this on to you. Talk to us about working with Stephen and um, coming to the end of the trilogy because it's been a it's been a big project. It has, mm. and in fact, I can uh, I mean we can go back to like the beginning of it as far as I was concerned which was uh, the 2002 BoucherCon in Austin, Texas. Mm, I think so. And uh, yes. Stephen was there and, you know, he, uh, we were hanging out, was it Barton Creek? Well, I remember exactly where it took place. Yeah, was at, at a, yes, at a point on Barton Creek overlooking Lady Bird Lake. Ah, uh, there we go. <laughs> and Stephen said, I have this idea, blah, blah, blah. And, and we basically walked around Barton Creek, which mm -hmm. is a uh, an Austin uh, landmark, and since I went to school there, as did Stephen, you know, we sort of both knew it. And he laid out this idea, which I thought was wonderful. And I remember uh, going out and uh, you know buying a copy of um, uh, Edward Rutherford's book. Mm -hmm. uh, we sort of talked about that kind of structure, one of his books, and. Uh, you know, reading that on the plane flight back and uh, Stephen started to work on it. And, you know, so it's been a project we've been at for almost 20 years. And it, it has evolved because originally my conception was we will do a single book called Roma, just as Edward Rutherford did London and Dublin and so forth. And James Michener before him did these kinds of books, which would follow, it, it's a city biography really, our place. Everything takes place in that location. So it's through time, how that evolves and the, and the cast of characters that keep moving through time. Uh, and I thought I could do Rome in one book. We would go from prehistoric Rome to Fellini. <laughs> but as I, as I began to scale the project, that was just out, you know, it was impossible to do that. There's too much stuff. So in Roma, we only went from the prehistoric Rome to Julius Caesar, and essentially the, the end of the Republic, beginning of the, of the empire. And so that was a standalone book. I really didn't know that there would be more, but I wanted to do uh, the, those crazy emperors that are so famous, Nero and all of that. So that became empire. And then I, don't, I didn't really know if that was the end of that, but then I really wanted to do more about this hazy period, which is very poorly uh, documented. There's not a lot of movies or novels about it which takes us to the dark, the dark period of the Roman Empire, which is after Marcus Aurelius, the great philosopher emperor, who has the largest extent of the empire. Uh, he, he inherited it from Hadrian. After him, his son Commodus, famous from the movie Gladiator. So everything goes to hell in a handbasket. And it's not entirely Commodus' fault or even the government's, but it's uh, because there are plagues, there are German barbarians invading from the North and that just ties everything up. The Persians are always active on the other frontier. So Rome goes through this really bad patch and there's just one emperor after another, very short uh, reigns. So that's just kind of a choppy area. How do you make a novel out of that? But I hope I've managed to do that with Dominus, which takes us from Marcus Aurelius to the first Christian emperor, Constantine. So Keith, how did you get talked into doing volumes two? <laughs> well, I mean, um... The usual way, which is, uh, you know, we, uh, volume one actually did rather well. It actually yes. even sort of hit the extended New York Times list and uh, all of that. And then um, the thought was, well, there's all this great time. Let's do another one. Now, there was some discussion of how we do volume three, because all the, all the really great imperial stuff was uh, going to be over with. And you're going to all of a sudden have to deal with, you know, 
emperors that no one's heard of and, and not exactly the same exciting time, you know. The fall of Rome is nowhere near as exciting as the rise of Rome. But that's not uh, as sexy. It isn't as sexy. Yes, that's <laughs> that's quite true. And Gibbons you know. has already done it. So there you are. And Gibbons did it. Yeah, but you know, Gibbons, there's some problem with him. He's a, one of the most wonderful writers. He wrote the, the Decline and Fall of the of the Roman Empire, the famous book, six-volume book. He is one of the greatest pro stylists in, in the English language. I mean, these sentences are just so dazzling and beautiful. But, and he also, he was the first person who could read the Latin and Greek and go to these sources nobody else could read. He just dug them out of the churches and you know, wherever they were hidden. And so he kind of constructed this story about the, that latter part of Rome going into what we call Byzantine times. But he accepted the veracity of sources, which later historians kind of throw out the window. And that's a big problem with this period because one of our major sources is this crazy book. Uh, uh, it's called Historia, the Historia Augusta, which for years they thought it was by many authors because there are all, all these emperors with, with other authors, but they figured it had to be one author. And it's almost like a spoof or a satire. I mean, so much of it is so outlandish that you don't know what's real and what's not real. And that's kind of one of your primary sources. And other sources are also choppy or fragmentary. So it's uh, it's it, so so Gibbons accepted a lot of the crazy stuff and he just put it in there as if it were fact. So his book is a bit fantastical at this point. What about Robert Graves? How um, authentic is I? Well, thought you know that, that's Robert Graves. Your second book. Robert Graves did the things that happened in Empire, which is uh, the Emperor Augustus and his crazy family, which ends up with Nero, and uh, you know it's just sexy stuff. There's a lot of you know the sexual intrigue, the women. Lots of murders and poison and intrigue, and um, oh, and you have you have a, a, a Caligula, you have the, the, sort of the crazy ones, uh, but and Robert Graves too, because the material is just so tempting. I think Robert Graves does accept a lot of the stories that you know we don't necessarily think are real anymore. So I mean, he's and he's another great stylist. I mean, he's a fantastic writer, and thank goodness he gave us I Claudius because I think I've inherited many of his, you know, the people who love those books. He, he is the, one of the writers who made it so popular for so many readers. But here's a question for you. I've always wanted to know this. Is he, is he the one who invented the idea that Claudius was actually smart and intelligent and not the bumbling fool? No, I don't think so. I, I'm, I'm, it's almost like he inverted it the other way. He wanted us to think that most people thought Claudius was bumbling but he was gonna show us the real story. I think most historians, when they look at Claudius, it's kind of a, uh, he's not sexy, he's not sexy. He's old when he inherits it. He, uh, he's a very serious ruler. Uh, he has the wife, Messalina, who messes around and has to kill her. Uh, so I think Robert Graves, he, he worked with what he could work with. And by making Claudius the narrator and the focus, he's the one who observes everything that happens before him from the sidelines. So it was, a, it was a narrative strategy that Robert Graves used that worked. It did. It made very good television. Of course, Derek mm. oh, yes. was a superb actor, you know, to bring mm. it to life. But, you know, I always think, I mean, it, it, it's sort of like my Maltese Falcon thing. I have often asked it, well, not often, but occasionally asked at book events where somehow or other it's come up. How many people have actually read the Maltese Falcon <laughs> as opposed mm. to seeing the movie? And I do think there are people who, you know, who genuinely feel they know the story, but they have never read the book. They've read the, or seen mm. the dramatization. And, you know, I suspect that more people have seen I, Claudius than have read I, Claudius. Oh, I think very much so, very much so. You know, but now did your own research into uh, your wonderful Gordianus series, because it ends with, with Julius Caesar. Hmm. Um, and in fact, the last time we talked was was the last Gordianus book when right. you know, Keith came to Scottsdale and we were all there and it was wonderful. Um, did that, because the, your first book goes along there. So you already had a lot of foundational research and so forth for Roma. Um, sure. Yeah, the, the last book in the Gordianus series, which may indeed be the capstone because it does come to a kind of conclusion. Uh, and a coda is called The Throne of Caesar, which is about the assassination of Caesar. And the challenge there was to make a murder mystery about the assassination of Caesar, because we all know who did it, right? So that I had to kind of do a, a plot that comes in from the side. Um, but the, the reason, when I first was researching Roman blood, I had studied Roman history. 
uh, and Byzantine history in college. I was a history major at, at UT Austin. And so I had that kind of foundation of how do you research, being skeptical of sources, that kind of thing. So, but Roman Blood, um, I remember the editor for that book, Keith's previous, who, whom he was an assistant to, which was Michael Dennedy, uh, he sent the book out to be read before it was published by a fairly hostile reader. It's this guy, he's a, he ended up having a, a history book, but uh, Michael wouldn't publish his novel about ancient Rome. And yet he asked him to read my novel about ancient Rome. Well, you can see the, you know, the chip on the shoulder there. But this guy was very well versed in the period. And Michael Dennedy, uh, he, he called me or sent me a letter saying, well, that first reader has found an error that, you know, it should maybe want to fix this, but, you know. And so it ended up being, I thought, what have I done? I've totally gotten something wrong about it, genealogy or something like that. But I had a house that was decorated with marble. And we don't have marble in Rome until maybe 30 years later, when it's acceptable to put it on your house rather than a temple. So it was not, it was the most, not the most crashingly horrible thing, but that taught me that there were gonna be people out there who knew more about any aspect of Rome than I did, military history or food or anything like that. So I've always tried to be as careful as possible about the research. And one of the joys of what I have done as a writer has been this decades long process of being allowed to be essentially a graduate student, you know, just all my life and just doing research, going to the UC Berkeley library or the UT Austin library, spending hours in the stacks, now, hours and hours, of course, online, because everything is online now about the ancient world, all the sources. Um, so the research has been just one of the most enjoyable, joyous things about the whole process of being an historical novelist. So carrying that forward into the Roma Empire Dominus books was just more icing on the cake for me. Keith, how much fun has this been for you? Well, I mean, first of all, I have to tell one of my favorite stories about like uh, historical uh, picking at, at Stephen, which was uh, the cherries story, mm. which of yes. course, you know, there was, uh, you know, there was a throwaway line. I've forgotten exactly what it was, but Gordianus compares like his uh, slave slash wife's lips to cherries. Mm. And some one read it in the German translation <laughs> and wrote a letter saying, actually, we know when cherries reached Rome, they didn't get to Rome for another 20 years. And so we had to change that one throwaway line in whichever book it it's was. It's in Roman blood, yeah. And uh, of course, later, Stephen, being Stephen, you know, sort of pondered over this for a long time and then finally wrote a story about how cherries got to Rome earlier than we actually knew. Well, Just well, so he that's, could be right. that's not quite right. I, I wrote a, uh, we know that they were brought to Rome by the military general Lucullus from Asia Minor, Turkey. That's he found them when he was conquering something over there. And he's like, this is fantastic, cherries, right? So he brings it back to Rome. Everybody's got to have a cherry tree in the garden. Everybody wants to see cherries. So we know when cherries reached Rome, that it was a bit later than in Roman blood. And I must admit, I did not know that at the time I wrote Roman blood. Uh, so I, 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 in order to sort of heal the psychic wound, I did end up writing a short story called The Cherries of Lucullus. Because we know that Lucullus later in life kind of had dementia apparently, what we would call that. And so uh, we kind of know why he didn't become emperor, for example, because he kind of lost his marbles. So I, I was able to write a short story involving cherries and Lucullus and move on from, from the cherries. You know what, yeah. it's fiction. You're entitled to make stuff up if you want to. Well, you know, um, there are some historical novelists who are pretty freewheeling as far as, you know, they'll just, they'll change where something happened or who are like, well, or who is married to whom, or who is whose child, and that just violates rules for me. I, I can't go there. I, if, I will not knowingly make an error. Okay. I will say there is one geographical change I made in one of my books, uh, something that doesn't actually exist in, in a particular city. Uh, I'm not going to say what it is. It is the one error, the one error I've intentionally let through. But if some reader finds that and sends it to me, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send them a no prize. Was that in Missoula? Barbara, <laughs> no. you're giving it away. Yes, it actually was in Last Scene in Missoula. That's what I thought. The only reason I know that is because I think we discussed it back then, but 
That's oh. when I discovered, I love that book because it never occurred to me that there was actually a civic funded position called the scapegoat. The scapegoat. And one of the scapegoat. things that's so much fun about reading Stephen's books is just all the wonderful stuff you learn, not you know, like the major battles necessarily, but I mean, who knew? that this I mean, scapegoat was an actual career path. Yes, I've, I've never been crazy about the military history, as you know, I've, that isn't a big thing in the books. But when you find something like the scapegoats, you've got to use this. Absolutely. I mean, it comes from the ancient Greek world. It was in Greek cities, which were colonies all over the Mediterranean. And in periods of particular uh, turmoil or menace, like your your uh, your city under siege, or you're having a plague or something, yes, you, you find somebody who is willing to be the scapegoat. And that person is going to psychically, magically take on all of the sins of the city and process all the evil eye problems and so forth. And but will live high on the hog, high on the hog for a period of time. At the end of that time, he'll be thrown off a cliff, <laughs> taking with him, <laughs> taking with him all of the bad karma that the city had attracted and everything will be fine after that. So that was, yes, I mean, as I say, when you when you study the ancient world, you have to really get into this magical frame of mind uh, as to how things work. Well, sure, because they didn't have any real explanation. I mean, they yeah. endowed everything. I think about the Greeks, every damn tree had its own nymph or naiad or dryad or- and It's called animism, know. yes, yes. Yeah. Um, um, and, you know, well, I mean, the Japanese have done that, did that too. A lot of ancient Japanese um, theology, so to speak. Well, you know, I, I have had these moments of thinking I have got, gotten a glimmer of what it might have felt like to have the ancient mindset every now and then. And it comes from just weird, what, you never know where it'll come from. And one of them was I was running in a Berkeley Park, uh, a rugged fire road, and I came around a corner and there were these two women who are a certain kind of Berkeley type. They're Volvo driving, they sort of wear loose flowing robes and they have long hair. They're old hippies, they're old hippies. And as I passed them, I kind of thought that about them. I sort of categorized them in my mind and moved on. And I rounded a corner and I tripped and fell. And anybody in the ancient world would have instantly made a connection between the two events. I did something psychically toward those women. They picked up on it and they hexed me. And that's why I fell. I mean, the, uh, there's not a moment in your life when this isn't possible to be happening to you. So you're very careful about, you know, how you uh, uh, navigate in the world. Okay, I can see Berkeley would give you plenty of <laughs> to figure Just that many, out. Many as druids, a, as druids. A Stanford, <laughs> as a Stanford girl, Berkeley, you know, remains, <laughs> you know, uh, my own vision of Berkeley. All right, so Keith, you've been, you've been doing this all along. Um, Want to tell us about, you know, like highs and lows or favorite books or, what? Oh gosh! I mean, I mean, well, I will say the the best thing about having a thirty year relationship is just you know the you know the constant you read and you can watch the writer sort of grow. I mean, I personally have many favorites, but what would happen is the new book would come in and he would try something new and it would it would be interesting in new and different ways. Now, of course, you know, I feel like he's sort of you know been able to tie everything up which is, you know, a rarity. I mean, how many Ooh, authors there. get to like bring to conclusion their, their, their no. sort of, you know, uh, work that way. And that was one of the best parts about like publishing Dominus was just the chance to sort of bring a sense of conclusion to, uh, you know, the work we've been doing for, you know, 30 years. Whereas George R. R. Martin's editors will be waiting from now until doomsday. Oh, you know, um, <laughs> I have to, I, I've met his his editor and, and uh, she pulled one of my favorite stunts ever, which was one of the books he was he wanted to see the cover and he was running late. And he was sending, you know, he, you know, she said, well, you know, if you send in some pages, I'll send you, you know, the cover. So he sent in 50 pages. So she cut a one inch strip off the cover <laughs> and mailed it to him. So as he was sending pages, she'd send him another strip of cover. Quid pro quo, yes. Well, Keith, you, you said something about uh, writers growing. I hope I have grown as a writer. I've, I mean, I've certainly aged. I've gotten older, hopefully a little wiser. Um, the style of the books has changed over time. The early books are so, uh, I, you want to pack in so much sensory detail uh, in, in, into the historical novels. 
I got more, I got, I became a leaner rider as I went on, which pleased me. You know, I don't know if it works for all, all readers, just leaner prose, more, more plotting. But I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to do this because I think it's really rare among the writers I've known um, to be able to actually kind of work at your own pace and to do what you want to do and to do not one but two series pretty much to your own satisfaction and bring them to a climax is, um, it's just, it, I really feel very good about that. And I owe a lot to you, Keith, uh, for the continuity. Or, or for my sheer lack of like unwillingness to leave St. Martin's Press and, you know, and go off and yes, do something else. That's, that's the, the continuity. And I've had the same agent since forever too. Right. And you've had yeah. the same bookseller. We've done and I've had Barbara three Peters. Of us have done this. Seriously, we have done this. I was mm. thinking that the three of us have done this together since Roman blood. Yes, you know? it, which is a wonderful thing. Yeah. It is. Now, and Keith is also um, the editor, although yeah. not from the beginning, of another Roman series by Lindsay Davis. And she did, in fact, bring the Marcus Didius Falco series to its end um, and is now doing something different. So there must be something about Keith that, you know, it makes think, people want to like give up and do something else. Yes. <laughs> well, I was thinking no. that, you know, about the continuity thing. I often think about my dear friend, Edith Pargeter, who is Ellis Peters, wrote the Brother mm -hmm. Canville series, which in fact, Derek Jacoby, whom we've earlier mentioned in I, Claudius, starred as, and she wanted to write the Brother Cadvilles all the way to when Henry II ascended the throne. But unfortunately, she developed a, well, this long story, but anyway, she died um, before she could get there. But the wonderful thing was that the 20th Brother Cadville was in its own way, a capstone to the series. And I spoke to her not long before she died. And I think she was okay with that. Um, you know, that she didn't get where she was going entirely, but she got in 20 books in a series. That's a remarkable achievement, isn't it? What was her name for those books? It wasn't e Edith Pargeter. It was the- uh, Ellis Peters. Ellis Peters. 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 You yeah. know, I have to say, Ellis Peters, that was all happening just before I started writing. Yes, it was. My um, books. Morbid Taste for Bones was um, and, Anna, and I, Anna and the Rose. Those two books, Stephen, the name of the Rose. kicked off um, yes. a revival mm -hmm. of historical mystery because during the, during the 80s, the early 80s, the historical fiction, you know, was historical fiction. And for some reason or other, everybody lost interest in it and people who wrote historical fiction merged into crime for a while. And in the 90s, remember, Keith, there was this yep. huge wave of, yeah. of historical fiction and medieval series. But I think it was Umberto Eco and um, yes. mm -hmm. and Ellis Peters' of Morbid Taste for Bones that really gave impetus to that, which was I helpful agree. to you. that Because there were, at one point, there were at least three Roman series. There were two or three ancient Egyptian series, not just, um, you know, Barbara Mertz writing as... Um, Oh, there was PC Doherty. There was um, um, there was a guy named Ron Burns who did like three or four. Uh, and there Lauren was Haney. Linda Robinson, you know, um, Murder in the Place of Anubis, and she well, wrote and Sharon Newman doing medieval yeah. mysteries. Yeah. But I mean, it was interesting that you know, and there was a cluster. I remember asking. There was one one author who attempted to write like ancient Babylon. And it hmm. just didn't work out. And I remember maybe it was you, Keith, that I asked, you know, why is it that historical mystery clusters around Rome more than certainly more than Babylon or Assyria, but maybe there were a few in Greece. And then it kind of is medieval. And then everybody skips of Anne Elizabeth and everybody skips the restoration, you know, the 17th century and, and most of the 18th and heads to Victoria. And I, you know, I often wonder why it is that there are these clumps in history that attract um, writers and readers. Maybe it's just familiarity, Keith. What do you think it is? You're the person I, who knows I about think marketing. I think there's that. I think that there are certain parts of the world that readers are interested in that you can sell enough copies of a book. You know, it's easier to walk into my sales department and say, "Here's a new book on ancient Rome." than it is to say, it's great. This is fourth century Bulgaria. <laughs> Just, it fails to, it might be interesting. It might be well-written. It might have a period uh, that, you know, people should know about, 
but it's hard to convince stores that people do want to know about it. <laughs> Bulgaria. Well, and, and then also, I think it's also the sources themselves. Certain periods of history just are very rich with characters, larger than life characters. I mean, in writing about, I, I tried to write, before Roman blood, I tried to write a, an historical novel about the Byzantines, the very late Romans, almost medieval, because I thought there was this great story I could tell. And I just, I couldn't get any traction because you couldn't, what did they eat? What did they wear? You don't have visual templates, you don't have cookbooks, you don't have erotic poetry. Oh, you have all that with ancient Rome. You have just this, this huge, vast store of, of visual material, statues, pom, uh, paintings from Pompeii, architecture, all this kind of thing. And I think probably other periods are rich in the same way as far as having not only great sources, but larger than life characters. And I think that's part of it. I mean, what fires the reader's imagination? There have been many attempts to write, you know, historical mystery series set in colonial uh, America. Ooh. And <laughs> most of them can't don't fail because, I can't see it. you know, the pilgrims just don't excite. <laughs> In Unless it's the Scarlet, you know, just, the Scarlet know, Letter. <laughs> you know, that's been written. I don't think <laughs> that's, it's that was done. Well, I think you're right. Although, Stephen, I think there's a lot more known about Byzantium and that civilization than there used to be. And Justinian yes. and Theodora are a really sexy couple. Um, and, you know, I, I think it's possible now that you could do something with that when maybe it wasn't. Well, it's my, it's one of my all time favorite periods. And I, I think that's true because when I was a, when I was a college student way back in the seventies, it's very, there were everything from ancient Rome and Greece had been translated in the 1800s, just by all the German and English translators. A lot of the Byzantine stuff had not been touched right. by, by anyone since Edward Gibbon. It just was laying there. So we, we had all this untranslated Greek material and it was Greek to me as it was to very many other people. But now I, I recently just for pleasure went back and was doing some of that reading and also trying to see where I might want to end Dominus. And so much of that stuff has finally been translated just because the scholars finally got around to it. There were graduate students who needed work to do. Well, let's translate this, let's translate that. So yes, if somebody wants to attempt a Byzantine historical novel, there's a lot better chance now of finding just those nuggets of fascinating information about people's lives or uh, scandals and such. You bet. Rich stuff there. So what are you thinking of doing now? Now? Well, I, I don't know. I think, I, you know, I'm drawing social, I'm not drawing my social security yet, but I could. I'm on Medicare. I turned 65 just a few months ago in March. And I, doesn't everybody retire when they're 65? Oh, and writers don't retire at all. I mean, I'm, I, I have been told this: the writers cannot retire. They really don't. Booksellers don't retire, and clearly editors don't retire. Although I think Heath is the baby in this particular yes, generation. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, certainly younger. I'm not sure that young applies. And well, bit... comparatively speaking, I mean, I'm 80 and Stephen is 65. So where is that? You know, we don't. You don't have to admit your age, but I think you come in as the uh... junior. It's um, true. Uh, I mean, well, but about turning 65, there is something in, in my mind, in my personality, my psyche, my character, that I am beginning to feel kind of, the, you know what it is? I don't have a deadline right now. I am, I am also the lucky writer that starting early on from way back uh, in 1990 or 1993, I have been on contract to write books because of my agent, Alan Evans, and my editor, Keith Kayla. They've had me in harness just year after year. And I'm not complaining. This is every writer's dream to have the security, essentially, of a job. You know, I've got, after this, I'm going to do two more books because that's on contract. So what will they be? My editor wants to know. I have to come up with something. And it's been a delight to always have something coming up ahead, doing advanced research for that, kind of feeling it out. Where's the story? Where's the murder mystery element? But right now, just because I finished the Guardiana series, maybe, with Throne of Caesar. I like to and do maybe. Please. Well, please. well I, you know, I never say never, because as has been pointed out to me by many people, when I first had Roman blood, the few public appearances I made and the few interviews that I did, talked to people, I always said, this is a one-off like Bame of the Rose. I've written my Roman mystery. I don't know what I'll do now. And then fortunately, my editor, Michael Dennedy, uh, it, the book was just successful enough that he wrote me and said, where's the sequel? 
And I thought, well, hmm, we are, this is the ancient Roman Republic with murders and scandals and trials and intrigue everywhere you look and actual murder trials that you can read the transcript from, from and Cicero. And voter fraud, you know what? Oh, voter mean, fraud, it's got kind of everything. here in Arizona during this insane, you know, audit, I have to think about, you know, Catalina's riddle because- Oh yeah, because it's a republic, there's that kind of intrigue and certainly, Living in America, we can always look at Rome as a kind of funhouse mirror and see if we can see ourselves and what's going on. Uh, so anyway, I was allowed that chance to, to do a series. And uh, I found that there was just endless material and I had a great appetite for it. Uh, but right, and then of course the, the trilogy, being able to do the family saga with Roma Empire Dominus, all the way from prehistoric Rome to Constantine and the end of paganism, essentially. I mean, that's just a huge arc of very important history. Um, and having sort of finished those two series, and now I, I do not have a, a contract. Uh, I just, I haven't kind of come up with the next idea. My agent has kind of poked at me. Um, so I don't know, I, I, it's very relaxing not to have a deadline for the first time in 30 years. I'm Something that, for a always longer. looming. It, well, I'll see, I may get, who knows, maybe I'm going to get antsy. And uh, yeah, it's the Byzantines, as you say, those Byzantines, now that we have a lot of translated material, I might, oh, yeah. I, I'll be looking at that. Yes, I'll be reading through that and see what I find. We can always get Janet Hutchins to give you a call and ask where the stories are. The, sh the short, you know, I, I was also delighted when I first started being a mystery writer and a mystery reader, that's, I first came to reading Sherlock Holmes and other authors, and I was a voracious mystery reader. And one of my favorite authors was Stuart Palmer, who wrote the Hildegard Withers mysteries, which are, they come in and out of print from the 1930s about a spinster school marm sleuth in New York City. And I love those books. I love those books. And I love what Stuart Palmer did. He not only wrote the novels, he wanted to write short stories about Hildegard Withers. And so he wrote scores of short stories. And virtually all of them appeared in Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine, which is with us to this day. And is Janet still editing? I, I've kind of left it aside for a while. She's Hutchings. still there. See, I had the continuity there because I saw Janet Hutchings took over from the previous editor like the month that I sent in, in my first story about Guardianus as a short story. And so she, was, she, she bought that story. So I've had the same short story editor as well this entire time for two, vol two volumes of short stories. But being able to sort of do the Stuart Palmer thing as an homage almost to him, to not only have the novels, but to have the short stories for the little, like I wanted to have a death by bee sting. Well, I don't think you can make a novel out of that, <laughs> but you can do a pretty good short story out of that in ancient Rome. Um, so I was able to do the, the things that weren't novel size, I could do as short stories. So that was a whole other adjunct of the series was being able to do two, two books worth of those. Well. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to the very beginning, I remember after um, you know the uh, second book came in, Michael said, ah, "Call call Stephen and find out, figure out what he's doing for the third book." He said, "Okay, I've got this plan. There'll ah, be three books. Three It'll books. Be a trilogy." trilogy. Said, it's gonna be a trilogy. You know, it could go one further than that. He says, "But but I have a plan." <laughs> well, well, I don't, that I became don't five know. books, and then he threw the plan out the window. Well, yes. Once I once I got past Catalina's riddle, then everything opened up in front of me. I, and then it was my goal became to get to Cleopatra, because all of this really begins for me at a drive-in theater outside of Gulfway, Texas, where as a child, eight years old or something, I saw this movie I had been dying to see called Cleopatra on the drive-in screen in the middle of cow fields pastures with Elizabeth Taylor's Cleopatra. And Rex Harrison as Caesar and uh, Richard Burton as Mark Antony. And that created such a, an impression on my mind that that is one of the great myths of my life is the story of Cleopatra and especially the way it's told in that movie. Uh, so I, when I realized I was gonna write a longer series and get to Julius Caesar, it's like, I gotta get to Cleopatra. I gotta get to Cleopatra. So rowing after her. And she kept sort of slipping away. There were stories I had to do before I could get there. Certain stories would crop up in the material. And finally, we do get to Cleopatra in, in Roma as well, uh, a little bit. But I finally get to do my Cleopatra in a couple of the later books, uh, especially after she meets Caesar and her rivalry with her younger brother as to who is going to be Pharaoh of Egypt. 
is an interesting thought. Yeah. I mean, what... let me let me just give Steve this gotten... interesting just... thought, Keith. Hang okay. on a minute. While I was touring around Egypt in December of 2019, right before COVID, mm -hmm. um, what what dawned upon me um, is that while all these tombs have been discovered and we have lidar and so so forth. No one has found the tomb of Alexander, and no one no. Has found mm -hmm. Cleopatra's tomb. And I think I think that would be really fascinating to um, explore what might have become of her. The tombs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, where yeah. is she? She has to be somewhere. Well, you know, well, you know, my my editor Alan Evans has tried to light a fire under me. He says, Stephen, because you have all of this uh, this knowledge of the history and stuff. Why don't you do one of those mysteries like the Da Vinci Code, where there's a modern day story of a quest for a, an, art, an artifact or something. And of course, every archeologist in the world would love to find the tomb of Alexander the Great and the tomb of Cleopatra. Yeah. Maybe they're buried side by side, who knows? You can find both of them in the same book. <laughs> you, could do, you could do a Dan Brown, an ancient one though, where you know, ah. there's no reason that somebody couldn't have been looking for it after she died. It doesn't have to be contemporary. That would probably be a Byzantine. <laughs> Oh, there you are. Sorry, I, 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 <laughs> Wait, this is getting too too crazy. Keith will never buy this idea. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. A story conference when we're over. Steve, I, I mean, sorry, I interrupted you, Keith. So go back to whatever you wanted to say before I did that. So we Oh, I was going to say one of the things that was sort of interesting in watching the series is uh, every so often I felt like with each book, uh, Stephen wrote a slightly different. He did write the same book every time mm -hmm. there was always some different yeah. thing going on um in one of them gordianus is actually you know an unreliable narrator mm -hmm. you know when you find out mm -hmm. something happens <laughs> say, no more. Which one. say no more i will say no uh, more but you know, you've been reading it all of a sudden it's like he turns the tables and i felt that, like that was um, one of the things that kept it interesting to me was you know stephen was going to write a different type of book each time just oh, a little yeah. bit it would be, i was reading so much mystery fiction just absorbing all that that i really wanted one of my goals to be not only to have like the historical stuff that's all accurate and fascinating and there are larger life personalities and there's a family story going on with Gordianus uh, and the slave boys he he uh, he adopts and his wife his concubine but we would also have a different kind of mystery plot for each book. I wouldn't just do the same kind of mystery, like a courtroom mystery, so on and so forth, which many readers do fall into the trap of pretty much is that because the readers liked it the first time, they like it the second or the third time too. Uh, so I wanted to come up with a different angle for each of the mystery plots. And some real inspirations for that were Agatha Christie, because she went through the, she also did these things where she, she wanted to mix up, you've got the sleuth, the detective, the victim, the killer, a few other things in each mystery story. And she wanted to kind of switch all of these things up. Like in certain of hers, the sleuth is the, well, the, 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 sleuth is the victim, the detective uh, is the criminal, so forth and so on. Like, in, well, I won't say a famous play, but she, she did that. And then finally, Colin Dexter, Colin Dexter, who um, did the Morse mysteries, after Agatha Christie had plowed all of that ground, there's no way anybody could come up with any new angles within this, the, those mystery elements. Colin Dexter does one where I, I, I can't really say what he does, but he, he, ta he did something so original as to which of these roles kind of does a switcheroo on you that I was just in awe, I was in awe of it. So those masters, Stuart Palmer's another great plotter, not only charming, with Hildegard Ritter's, but a fantastic plots. And Ruth Rindle, I mean, uh, I, I think I've read virtually every Ruth Rindle book, which I don't know how many human beings can say that, because there are like 60 or 70 of those books. But the thing was, they were always different. Yeah, you, were all, you weren't getting the same thing over and over. And the greatest pleasure, and I thought, if I can ever do this as an author, this was, is the gift I want to give a reader, is that I, some of her books, uh, I would read through the book and I, I would be getting to the last 10 pages. I would think she's not going to pull this off because there's no way she can tie this up and it's going to make any sense. I, I, I follow everything. And then you get to that next to last page and you sort of, sort of hackles in the back of your neck. She's going to do it. And you turn the page and there it is. <laughs> 
And the feeling you have as a reader is not, oh, she tricked me or she fooled me. It's like, damn, I knew it all along. She did give you exactly what you needed to know before she reveals. So, I mean, just all that, I mean, all that kind of expertise is just always dazzling me. So it's been, uh, it's been something I've tried to do in my books. You've done it very well. And it must have been fun for you, Keith, as the editor, to be constantly challenged by all these different forms. I think Simi Sola by Ruth Rendell was one of my, it was my mother's favorite Ruth Rendell. Um, although, you know, many of, many readers just read the Wexfords and the Barbara Vines mm. are sometimes a little difficult. Oh, those, those standalone Ruth Rendells are just but there. Simi Sola was Gold. a ground baking and I thought brilliant. Um, Brilliant book. But yes, one of the joys of your books is that they are so different. So let's go back before we call up Patrick. Um, do you want to give us just a brief summary of Dominus? I mean, we kind of lost it in this whole discussion. Yes, yeah, there's so much to talk about. You know, um, Dominus um, begins with one of the wisest rulers of ancient Rome, Marcus Aurelius. He's still, we read his meditations. I read them as I have become older. They mean a lot to me. When I was younger, I tried to read them and they, they didn't resonate. Now I'm 65. I know what Marcus Rilis is talking about because he was writing these. He wanted to be, he wanted to be in Rome and be a philosopher with his philosopher friends and you know, live this, this elegant life. And instead he had to go to the German frontier and kill Germans, just a bloodbath every day. You know, this nightmarish existence, uh, far from Rome, far from philosophy and all that. And he wrote those meditations to comfort himself, to, to sort of make the ground rules and how am I going to cope with reality? It's stoicism. And uh, so Marcus Aurelius has come to mean a lot to me. And so I wanted to do Marcus Aurelius and his reign. And then of course, Commodus, uh, which I think the movie Gladiator gets so wrong. I talk about this in the author's note at the end. They just got it very wrong as to how they showed Commodus. There's a whole other angle to that, which is even better. And then after Commodus is when you have the horrible period when the Praetorian Guard, the military guards in Rome, actually auction off who, who will be emperor to the highest bidder. It's like the lowest. You just can't get any lower than that. So you've already plummeted down to that. And then you just have a succession of very strange things, including Elagabalus, as we know this emperor today, who is sort of the drag queen emperor. He was perhaps a transsexual. Uh, he doesn't last. It's a very brief reign, a very brief but colorful reign. He's one of the, he's one of the ones that the sources are unreliable because they, are, they say just the craziest things imaginable about him. There's a famous painting by Alma Tadema of this banquet in Rome where these rose petals are fluttering down and they're going to smother all, all of the guests and they'll die from a deluge of rose petals whether intentional or not, unleashed by the Emperor Elagabalus. That's how decadent he was. And historians don't really buy that anymore. Probably the reason they got rid of him was, well, first of all, he was very young. He was only like 17 or 18. He didn't know how to run the place. His mother was kind of a stage mother. And his aunt was also had her eye on it with her son, his cousin. So there's family intrigue. And also he tried to make his solar god from Syria, Elagabal, uh, who is a sun god, he wanted to make him top god in Rome, even above Jupiter. Well, the Romans were not going to buy into that. They were not ready for monotheism yet. That's not until Constantine. So in some ways, Elagabalus was ahead of his time. Anyway, you can see, I, it's just fascinating stuff. So, uh, and then we go through plagues, as, and of course, going through COVID. When COVID began, I said, this is going to be a real question for me. I've just written about the two big plagues in this period. Rome not, didn't just have one, they had another one. And that, that just knocked the wind out of the empire. And I thought, have I actually gotten anything right about psychologically what that feels like? And I think as I went through COVID, I could sort of see all the echoes of that. Certainly it has not been the culture devastating thing that it was for the ancient Romans because they had no, they had no vaccine. I mean, this thing just lasted for years and years, decimated the army, decimated the arts, as you can imagine. Uh, decimated the civil service. Who's going to? Who knows how to run the place anymore? Um, so then, it, and then eventually it reaches its very lowest ebb. And then it's Constantine the Great, who's a fantastic military leader, but also one of the most ruthless men who ever lived. There's one major historian, Ramsay McMullen of the era, who says of Constantine that there was never a more bloodthirsty emperor on the throne than Constantine the Great. 
And you know, compared to his predecessors like Nero and, and a Domitian, that's saying a lot. So I, having that in my head, I'm like, wait a minute, this is the first Christian emperor, and he's also the most bloodthirsty emperor Rome had yet had. So how do, who was Constantine the Great anyway? So he, he poses a great enigma for all historians to try to figure out his success and who was this guy really? And he's, I mean, he murders certain key members of his family in a way that you wouldn't even see this in I. Claudius. It's so nasty and just so psychologically devastating. So I wanted to get to Constantine the Great and do my portrait of Constantine the Great, who has rarely been attempted in fiction. Interestingly enough, Dorothy Sayers, the great mystery writer, she wrote a play about Constantine, not a novel, but it's just, it's hagiography. As a, as a good Catholic, she makes him into the saint that he often is portrayed to be, even though we know the bloodthirsty aspects of his career. So I'm like, um, and there's a, another wonderful novel by, by, by Evelyn Wall called Helena about the mother, but it's also about Constantine. And Frank Slaughter wrote a book about him. But none of them, I thought, just as Gladiator, I don't think gets Commodus at all right. I don't think I've ever seen a real uh, Constantine in fiction. So that was a big challenge that I, I hit that as the climax of the book. And so for me as a writer, that was like, can I actually do Constantine? Uh, and I think, I think because it's observed from the outside by the family members who work for him and uh, are scared to death of him, of course, but, uh, but he's sort of charming in another way. Uh, I, I hope I did get Constantine at least close, at least close to right. And then of course, at the end, this is Constantine makes his new city named after him, Constant, Constantinople, now better known as Istanbul. He makes that the new capital of Rome. So this is, this is a real watershed. Not only is Christianity coming in and replacing paganism, but the whole geographical thing is gonna shift over. What will become of Rome now? Uh, which has been the center of the world for so many centuries. And so that's kind of the climactic point that we come to in Dominus. So he used the family to basically thread mm -hmm. our way through all of this history. Especially, the especially because the, the Pinarius family, because of certain just accidents of history, they end up being master builders and, and sculptors, artists. This is kind of what they do. They end up passing this down through the family. So that was a really, it was a good way to be able to sort of show a certain, if you're gonna write a, a biography of a city, you gotta show the Colosseum. When did it begin? What did it mean to Romans? How many times did it burn? Many times. It's kept burning and burning and burning. Many fires in Rome. But uh, uh, so having a family of builders, you can actually sort of see these projects. And it also gets them into the sphere of the emperor because that's where all the money is coming from and the building projects. Um, that way we get to show Commodus actually honored his father. He didn't uh, stab him in the back or anything. He honored him by building this great column, uh, the column of Marcus Aurelius, because he wanted to have this, this spiral sculpture that would show his military exploits in Germany going up into the sky. Uh, so that kind of monument, not just the art, the architecture, but the art and what it meant to Romans and how the emperors used it as part of what historians call their program or their agenda. Uh, the, the, the family is sort of on the inside of all of that. Wow. So Keith, how wonderful to have an author who basically does all the heavy lifting. What do you <laughs> actually contribute? <laughs> I'm the one who puts the lousy cover on the, on the book. Yeah. Um, well, Keith's not going to answer that, but I can tell you. Um, okay, well, someone, someone's got to like, you know, take the manuscript and then. There are certain, there's just certain key things. I, Keith has never been a line by line editor of my work. I think I am a, a good enough writer of the English language, I hope, that I don't need to be, you know, every paragraph has got to have things fixed in it. Um, there's, a very, there's a very successful thriller writer, I happen to know, I'm not going to name him, but one time he was talking to me about this whole thing of um, uh, the out that the publisher always has is in your in every writer's contract, there's something called unacceptable manuscript. And it means whatever the publisher wants it to mean. It means we don't want to publish this book. Uh, and, I, and this author said to me, he said, every book I send in is an unacceptable manuscript. That's what the editor is for. And I thought, I just thought, whoa, I wouldn't want to be his editor because that's a lot of work in house. So, I, but, but Keith, every now and then Keith does spot just key things. 
He is the reader who, he knows the series, he knows mystery fiction, he knows the marketplace. So he, he is just, I can't name anything right off the top of my head, but there have just been, when he reads the manuscript, his notes, there, there's usually just some very key things about this, this needs to be over here, that shouldn't be in here, um, you said this already, <laughs> which is one of the real problems with authors. So no, his, his, uh, his craftsmanship has been very important in the series. Well, I think he's a brilliant editor, but, I, you know, but you're a brilliant author. So I wondered if, if Keith has less work to do editing you than perhaps some of his other authors. You don't want to admit to that, Keith, I'm just saying. I, I, will, I will say that when I, when I was training as an editor underneath the person I uh, thing, he said, it's a lot like being a doctor. Your first goal is to not do any harm. Don't kill the patient. <laughs> don't kill the book. Yes. So, you know, don't 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 feel the need to put your stamp on it if it doesn't, you know, need your uh, input. But there's, but if, you know, the thing is that being an editor is also your project manager. You're the one who carries the book through the through the house. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, there's always that aspect of it too. Uh, yeah, the editor is uh, the editor is kind of your guardian in the publishing house. That's the person who's going to look out for the book. I know. And try your to make sure has to sell your book to the sales team yes. because mm -hmm. you know at the end of the day, if the sales team doesn't respond to it, you're toast. Um, so no, I think and, you guys have had a wonderful collaboration. It's really been a pleasure to witness it. Well, the pleasure has been entirely mine. It's been great. Patrick, why don't we call you up before we exhaust everybody to see if we have questions or comments from the audience. All right. Um, yeah, I do have a, actually a really good question from John Peyton Cook, who I oh. think is the novelist. Yeah, mm -hmm. torsos and... Right. Uh, yeah. And he, he asked, yeah, Stephen, in writing Dominus, uh, Roma, and Empire, to what extent do you pay attention to other novels that may have touched on some of the same time periods, mm. not only Graves, but say Anthony Burgess's Kingdom of the Wicked, Yorsenar's mm. Memoirs of Hadrian, and Gore Vidal's Julian, which perhaps oh. takes place starting from the end of Dominus. Yeah, well, I, I, yes, I, well, exactly. I didn't want to do Julian because Gore Vidal did Julian, and he actually did it right. Also, Ibsen wrote a five act play about Julian, which is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I wonder if Vidal didn't kind of read Ibsen and get the inspiration. Um, I have read all of those books. I, I would say Anthony Burgess's Kingdom of the Wicked, yes, an influence on empire more so than Robert Graves because Burgess wanted to tell two simultaneous stories. The Christians, what's happening actually over in Jerusalem and what's happening in Rome and how, they, how it goes back and forth. So to kind of, although I keep the action entirely in Rome, you got to have this larger sphere of what's going on in the in the other parts of the world, um, but but in writing these books, I I generally really don't read that much historical fiction. I read it when I was younger. I read uh, Mary Renault, for example, the ancient Alexander in those books, and of course the books that have just been mentioned. Also, Mika Valtari, who wrote the famous book The Egyptian, oh, which was made into a movie. He also wrote an unbelievably brilliant book called The Roman which was also, I have to give some credit for something that happens in Empire because he wanted to show the reign of Nero, but he wanted to do it as a black comedy. And, uh, and, and so um, that was something I kind of used because how do you approach Nero in any way that's not sort of, you know, the craziness, blah, blah, blah. But as a black comedy is how he did it. And he did it by having a narrator of the Roman who is a complete moral cipher. This man has no good redeeming qualities whatsoever. And he is witnessing the reign of Nero. So you see it through his eyes. So you don't get any kind of, uh, any kind of moral judgments at all about Nero. You just see what's going on. And it's you, the reader, whose hair is standing on him, not the narrator. He's just going along with the flow. So that was something I did, I did import into part of the empire. So I was gonna, I was gonna answer this question saying no, no, but I have, when I think about it, yes, there are certain influences and homages that do come in from other authors. Um, I actually have, I have a question. Um, I know you've written a couple of uh, books set in different time periods, mm. uh, Texas history. You wrote mm. the one about O. Henry, um, the twist at the end. Can you just say a few words about twist at the end? Well, my least successful books. 
were the Texas books. Readers, I thought all the readers would, would want to go with me to Texas. What's wrong with Texas people? But those books didn't click with a wide audience, unfortunately. I did, I did like writing those books. They were important to me as just part of my, my own history and my uh, to satisfy what I needed to do as a writer. Uh, the O. Henry book is about the maybe America's first recorded serial murders, which took place in Austin, Texas in 1885. Black servant girls are murdered one after another, usually out in the room out back where they live, usually with an ax. They are outraged after death, which is the word they use for rape in the newspapers. And these crimes horrify Austin for a year. And I came across these, uh, there was a mention in some book about the servant girl annihilators, which is what O. Henry called those, the murderers, the unknown murderers. And I thought, serial murders in Austin? Why do I not know about this? I went to the microfiche at the Austin History Center and just the newspaper accounts one after another were just fantastic. The amount of detail that could be found out about these murders. Two trials eventually happened. So I wanted, I really wanted to make a book out of that and it became a twist at the end, which uh, uses O'Henry as the uh, main character. It's, we sort of see everything through his eyes, mainly because he's the only person of any note at all in Texas, it's just a backwater. <laughs> but most everybody's heard of O'Henry one way or another. And then I wrote another called Have You Seen Dawn, which was a contemporary novel of suspense, a set in a small Texas town, uncannily like the town I grew up in. It's just, you can hardly tell them apart. But I gave it a different name. Let's see. That's, you know, that's really about it for questions. Although I have a number of people saying, please don't stop writing. Please don't stop. Ah, Keep going. Ah. Well, I guess I put the, I kind of, on Facebook and other places, I've kind of put this out there about, you know, uh, I don't have a deadline. I'm feeling very relaxed, kind of loosened the belt. So, uh, you know, I, I guess maybe I'm testing the waters to see if there is an audience <laughs> that will actually ask me to please keep writing. Yeah, um, you know, or an editor, says something, for example. Who well, would like and, and Andrew, kick me, or my agent will kick me in the butt. Um, just as a, a twist at the end, and, and have you seen Dawn, which are my two least successful books. Roma has been the most successful book as far as sales worldwide in the US. And one of, one of the great moments as an author for me was going in my local Costco and seeing Roma on a table with the Stephen King books and, whatever, and the George R. R. Martin books. So I, when you see your book in Costco, that's kind of when you know, that, that's the big time. Right. Right. <laughs> I love that. Too funny. So, Keith, would you be willing to continue to edit Stephen? Should it all work out? You know, I uh, would love to know what he wants to write next. But of I, course, I've always liked working with Stephen. I'm in a, I'm in a, you know, also, Empire took me a long, I mean, excuse me, uh, Dominus took me a long time to write. And some of it is, was the research. I just had to build everything from the ground up. I just, had, I had to do more research about everything it was it was a, it was a really huge task, um, but and I also wrote it slowly, and I call this process slow writing. You heard of slow cooking? You know, you put the oven on a hundred and just leave it in there for eight hours. Well, you know, this book I think Dominus ended up being the same book I would have written as a younger man, like in a year, but I took much longer than that, and I think it's the same book. It just was slow. And part of the slowness is me enjoying it, enjoying the research, taking as much time as I want, and then writing it in a kind of a slower fashion. So, I mean, the, the enjoyment I got out of writing this book was just immense uh, and very satisfying. And I guess that's one of the reasons that I'm now kind of sated at the moment. And I'm not, I'm not champing at the bit to write the next book. But uh, uh, as I say, never say never. Never, never say, say never. never. I love that. It's been a real pleasure to spend time with you again, Stephen. I'm so pleased that we could um, inaugurate your your book on Publication Day. And it is um, it is really good to see you and hear your voice, Barbara. Well, thank I you. I really like that. It's just been such a pleasure for and Patrick too. I, always... I mean, it's remarkable. And Keith is one of my favorite people, and I miss him because we used to meet up at mystery conferences. We'd go out for breakfast and kind of dish the dirt and catch up on stuff. Are you going to go to New Orleans, Keith? Uh, no, the uh, the corporate heads have said no corporate travel <sighs> until possibly the fall, possibly later. So uh, none of the, uh, us are going. But you know, 
next year in wherever 2022 VoucherCon will be. You know, I was all set for Sacramento VoucherCon because that's just an hour from where I live in Berkeley, right? And I was, you know, Sacramento, but that's the one that got busted by COVID. Well, yeah. it didn't happen. Didn't happen. Um, and I was going to see know, Keith. I was going to see Barbara. Uh, well, we can. Well, we'll Twenty-two. See. We've had a lot of requests to do some small conferences, you know, like a thriller group and a historicon group and whatever it is. One of the great things about Zoom is that you can incorporate Zoom into a live event. You know, you can do something where, uh, well, you know, we've always we've always videoed our well, not always, but for at least twenty years videoed our events right to Facebook while they were in the store. So, you know, we didn't even have to do anything to do Zoom, except we had to all download the Zoom app and figure it out. But it wasn't, it isn't any different for us. But I think there are real possibilities for doing things where you have some people live and some aspects of it on Zoom, and then they can reach a huge audience where not everybody can travel. So St. Hilda's College is doing a, an event like that. Um, I'm not sure Harrogate is live, but they're probably doing some other things this summer. I don't know if New Orleans is going to have a Zoom component or not. There's a Malice. Keith, did you happen to notice the more than Malice roster? I mean, Malice I Domestic, did. did you notice who's going? CJ Box, Brad Thor, David Baldacci, Karen Slaughter? I I think they should all be forced to write a cozy. <laughs> Before being admitted. Yes. It's really interesting, though, you know, that you can bring together a group that for, for a, a basically cozy convention, a whole lot of writers who would never have attended it live. They're champing um, at the bit. <laughs> I mean, I, I really think there's some wonderful possibilities here. And Stephen, you clearly have an international audience. So you know, this this particular presentation uh, can be viewed by anybody everywhere. Um, there'll be a podcast tomorrow. So if you missed it live and, and you're catching the end of it, you can listen to the podcast. You can go back and watch the whole video. Um, you can find Stephen earlier in videos on the Poison Pen page and recommend to your friends that they watch it. So thank you, gentlemen. It's been an absolutely fabulous evening. Really appreciate it. And thank you all for watching it. Don't forget, we still have a few signed copies and possibly Stephen would sign another shipment if we completely sell out because we're down to just a handful. Um, and I have a selfish interest in that because he's promised me he might include a book if I send him any more books to sign that I don't own. My only no Stephen Saylor book in my entire I book. might even send that just in an envelope, Barbara, by um, itself. <laughs> I mean, you know, I have a wonderful library and there's like, a shelf and a half that is all Stephen Saylor from beginning to end, which means a lot to me. So um, I have a lot of books that Mr. Kayla has, in fact, edited. So, you know, in a way, Keith, I have you as, my, as a big collection as well, which is great. <laughs> great. Anyway, enjoy the rest of the evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank Good night, you. Y'all.